Today we're going to come back to a topic we've previously discussed, which is collisions. We've talked about this already in terms of linear collisions, two cars or objects that collide in a straight line path. We call this translational momentum. Remember that when we're thinking about collisions in terms of linear momentum, momentum for the system is conserved if there's, if there's no outside net forces. Previously we've defined what angular momentum is, and we're going to find out that angular momentum is also conserved. Consider the shown diagram. We've got a student running towards a merry-go-round with some initial velocity. They run and jump on and make the merry-go-round start spinning. If we look at this from the top view, let's imagine that student has some initial velocity and the merry-go-round is at rest so it's not spinning. And when they, when they run and jump on, they grab on and hold on, both the student and the merry-go-round will have some angular velocity in the end. The student will make it start to spin. So it's obvious we have a collision between two objects, but how do we think about this? Do we think about the translational momentum of each? In the beginning, the student has some translational momentum. They have a mass and a linear velocity, and the merry-go-round has no translational velocity. It's fixed about the pivot point. In the end, nothing has translational momentum. They only have angular momentum. Let's think about the system as a whole. If the system is defined as the student and the merry-go-round, before the collision, the system has translational momentum. It doesn't have any angular momentum. After the collision, the system as a whole has angular momentum. So how can we go from the system having translational momentum to the system having angular momentum? Well, there must be some way to go back and forth or convert between an object's translational momentum and an angular momentum. Remember, this is how we've defined both translational momentum, mass times velocity, and angular momentum, which is an object's rotational inertia times angular velocity. And a system can change its linear momentum or translational momentum if it experiences an outside net force for some amount of time. And an object or a system can change its angular momentum if it experiences an outside net force times time. So this is the question, how can we go back and forth between the two? If we knew how much linear momentum the student had, how much angular momentum does the student have? Or what's the equivalent angular momentum of the student? To get an expression to figure out how we go from linear momentum to angular momentum, let's use this equation down here. So the change in angular momentum of a system is equal to the torque it experiences multiplied by time. Our equation for torque, remember, is radial distance times force, just r times f, as long as these two things are perpendicular to one another. Now let's group the force and the time together and leave the r outside of that. So we get the change in angular momentum is equal to r times f times t. What is, if an object experiences a force for some amount of time, what does that give us? Looking back at this equation, that, remember, force times time is an impulse that something experiences, and that's going to tell us exactly how much its linear momentum will change. And so F times T is how much the linear momentum changes of a system. So we get the expression that the change in angular momentum is equal to radius times the change in linear momentum. Or we get the expression that the angular momentum or the equivalent angular momentum of an object moving linearly is equal to R times the linear momentum that it has, or L equals R times P. And this is going to be the equation that we use to convert between linear momentum and its equivalent angular momentum. There's a really good video produced by the YouTube channel called Flipping Physics titled Angular Momentum of Particles, and I would encourage you guys to visit the link below to see some great examples how linearly moving objects can transfer angular momentum to a spinning object, kind of like the example we just talked about. The video also shows how mass, velocity, and radius all affect an object's angular momentum. So we're going to think about the situation of a student jumping on a merry ground a little bit further and see what kind of questions you might be asked. So. Let's take the situation where a cylinder, or merry-go-round, of radius r and mass m is initially at rest. 
The cylinder is connected to a pivot that will allow the cylinder to rotate around the pivot in the absence of frictional forces. A student of mass m runs with initial speed v and jumps onto the cylinder. We're going to define the system as both the cylinder, the merry-go-round, and the student together. The first question is, what is the angular momentum of the student cylinder system before the collision? Well, the cylinder doesn't have any angular momentum because initially it has no angular velocity, so it can't have an angular momentum. So this term goes away. So the angular momentum of the system as a whole is just equal to the angular momentum of the student. Well, remember the student before the collision is just moving translationally. They're moving through space uh, with some linear velocity v. And so how do we figure out what their equivalent to angular momentum is? Well, think back to the equation we just came up with and derived. The angular momentum of the student is equivalent to their linear mo momentum times the radial distance. The question is, what is r? r is the radial distance the student is going to be away from the pivot point during the collision itself. And so if the student makes contact with the edge of the merry-go-round, they're going to be at a distance of r, or the radius of the cylinder, away. And so r will just be the radius of the cylinder, and p will be the linear or translational momentum of the student, which is just their mass times their velocity. So the student has an angular momentum of r times m times v, and that is the initial angular momentum of the system. So the answer is C. The next question is, what is the change in angular momentum of the student cylinder system from the moment before the collision to the moment after the collision? What's the change in angular momentum of the system? Is it zero? Is it m times v? Or is it r m v? Well, think about the system as a whole. What causes something to change its angular momentum? The equation is, change in angular momentum is equal to the torque it experiences times time. If we're assuming, like the problem statement said, that there's no frictional forces, then during the collision there's no outside torques. Uh, they're applying torques to each other and that's all internal and so there's no outside torques. And so the change in angular momentum of the system is just going to be zero. The angular momentum of the system has to be conserved. So the answer is a. Here's the last question we'll consider. What is an expression for the angular velocity of the cylinder after the collision? The rotational inertia of the cylinder about the pivot is I sub C, and the rotational inertia of the student at the outside edge of the rotating cylinder is I sub S. Remember, like we previously said, the angular momentum of the system doesn't change because the torque is zero, so delta L from beginning to end has to be zero. That means the angular momentum of the system, the whole system before the collision, has to be equal to the, the total angular momentum of the system after the collision. The angular momentum of the system before is the angular momentum of the cylinder plus the angular momentum of the student. The angular momentum of the system afterwards is going to be the final angular momentum of the cylinder plus the final angular momentum of the student. Remember that the cylinder has no angular momentum in the beginning, and so that term cancels out. And we already found out in the last problem that the angular momentum of the student in the beginning is equal to r times m times v. That's the angular momentum of the system as a whole in the beginning. That's got to be equal to the total angular momentum of the system in the end. Well, the angular momentum of any object is equal to its rotational inertia times its angular velocity. So the final angular momentum of the cylinder will be equal to its rotational inertia times its final angular velocity. And the same thing will be true for the student. Its final angular momentum will be equal to the rotational inertia of the student times its angular velocity. Since the student ran and grabbed onto the cylinder, they're going to be rotating at the same final angular velocity, so we can just use the same variable, omega, here for the final angular velocity of each. If we factor that out, we get rmv equals the sum of the rotational inertia of the cylinder 
plus the rotational inertia of the student all times the final angular velocity. So if we solve this for final angular velocity, we divide each side by IC plus IS, we get this as our final answer. That the final angular velocity, or an expression for that, would be equal to R times the mass of the student times the initial velocity of the student divided by the sum of the rotational inertia of both the cylinder and the student. So our final answer is D.